first branch of the Eightfold Path is not meditation. <laughs> Although, don't get me wrong, because you know, I'm talking to a bunch of meditators and saying it's not the panacea, because it is really important. It's the last branch, samadhi, you know, concentration. It is. And maybe it's the aspect of the, of the seventh and eighth branches. But the first branch is what's called right, in your books you're going to read right worldview. I don't like right, right and wrong for those two, samyak and mitya. True and false, is, it, it's not wrong to say right and wrong, or true and false, but right and wrong is immediately understood by people as right and wrong according to some rule. You know, like you're, you've, you follow the rules, so you're right and righteous. But I prefer it, it's not a rule, it's according to reality. So I, and I got this from Alan Wallace. That's the first place I saw this, and it just went click, I must admit, from my, my former student and good friend. Um, realistic is much better. Realistic and unrealistic is better than true and false because of its connotations for us. So realistic worldview is the first branch, and that is actually the wisdom branch. So wisdom comes first, right away in the path. And wisdom is not just mysticism or something like the, you know, like having an empty mind or something like that. Not at all. Wisdom is, is the word used for wisdom is the same word used for intelligence, but intensified. So super intelligence is what it's what it means. Pradnya. Nya is is kno, same root, Indo-European linguistic root for knowing, knowing. Right? We have a K-N, right? No, we don't pronounce the K, because it's hard to pronounce. In, in Sanskrit, which is a sort of primal in the European language, it's Gnya, Jnya, it's a J, it's even hard to pronounce, Jnya. So Pra and Pra means super, intense. And, and the way you super know something is, you first learn about it, you know, you learn what it's made of and how it works, and it's the whole thing about it. What, and you probe deeper and deeper, you drill down, try to find the full reality of something. And then you, you come up with different angles and perspectives on whatever you're examining. And then you sort of, you know, interlock them, you debate about them, you say, well, this is the only partial, and that's deeper. And so you critically investigate how you see the thing. And then finally, you may get to a point of, oh, it must be like this or that. And then you concentrate on that, and you come to a deep experience of it. And these are, and so you have what's called the wisdom born of learning, the wisdom born of critical reflection, which is a kind of meditation, like Descartes' meditations were critical reflection. They call it meditation de Descartes, critical reflection. And any kind of discursive meditation, in a way, is critical reflection. And then you come to one point in meditation, where through the critical reflection, you kind of come to a, to a brink of, it sort of must be that, but you know, maybe there's some doubt left, but you kind of understand, or at least you understand what it isn't, and now you have to focus on it. And then you, you, you combine a very high degree of concentration with that. So then that's wisdom born of what we could also call meditation or concentration you know, non-discursive meditation. So that's the first branch. And the key there is that he reports right away negation. That's why indeed even he expressed freedom. The word freedom, for example, we don't realize that because we live in America, where people like W shout about freedom, let's fight for freedom, or they hate our freedom. And like he comes from Texas, so he has freedom, he thinks. <laughs> freedom is a negation. You can't possess freedom. It's salt free. Where's the freedom? There's just no salt. <laughs> right? Sugar free, trouble free, depression free, anxiety free, addiction free. The freedom itself is just the lack of the addiction, anxiety, and the depression. The freedom is different. Free means free, you know, absent, lacking. Self free would be a translation of selflessness, free of self, a fixed self. So, so he, he expressed the prognosis in a negational way because the type of cognition that you have when you negate 
is different from the kind of cognition you have when you affirm, you know, positive cognition. And the delusion about your misascribing absolute status to things and yourself and selves is sort of confirmed every time you eyes, oh, there's a book, oh, there's Mark, oh, there's the cup. That, and the cup is a real thing, and my concept of cup fits right over that cup, and it goes to its essence. And my concept of Mark goes to its essence. My concept of myself goes to my essence. My first pronoun comes out of my essence. I, ego, ich, for dear Freud said ich. He didn't say ego, actually. He said ich. And, and uh, whereas when you don't find something, well, is there a book in this room? And you look everywhere, oh, okay. At some point you just stop looking. Is there an elephant in this room? Uh, okay, you stop looking. You don't ever find the elephant lessness of the room. You're just free of the worry about being trampled by the elephant. So he defined the prognosis as a freedom. Nirvana means freedom. But that's a negation. And, they, and we, negation is a very important thing in our practical lives, right? We won't, we won't eat it unless it's MSG free. We won't go to that Chinese restaurant. You know, we, if we're a vegetarian, we won't eat it unless it's meat free. If we, even if we're, if we're an organic kind of a, you know, meat eater, we won't eat it unless it's hormone free. Organic grass fed, whatever, 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 whatever. Right? So, so it's not that even though you don't really close around the negation, it's still a powerful thing. Very, very powerful, right? It involves how we negotiate interrelating with things, right? So by saying nirodha, nirodha means cessation, nirvana means extinction, blowing out. And finally, modern, we're so lucky to live in a modern world where we have hip language. But finally, we, in our popular language, we have nirvana right there. When you have gone to the great concert and people say, how was it? And you really had a great time, what do you say? I was blown away. <laughs> and that nirvana means being blown away, blown out. You know? The little flame of my anxiety, depression, and addiction was temporarily blown away even by aesthetic experience. So, but as the prognosis is, you can be blown away, which we're not afraid of, right? It's like that. If somebody said some deep negation, we would be really freaked out, maybe. So, although we're not, actually, as materialists in our culture, even though we have spiritual theories, but in the visceral way we go around, we go around being confirmed by authorities in our culture that we don't have to worry about anything beyond death, and perhaps our cemetery plot, and our life insurance, and our dear ones. But otherwise, we don't have to really worry about the state of our own consciousness beyond death. We're assured of that. And subliminally, we think so. Even we think we're a Buddhist and we believe in it, we say, but actually, we don't live as if we believe in it, mostly. We really don't. Or we would change our way we live, for sure. So, um, so the first one is this realistic worldview. And then you might think, well, realistic worldview means that you have to believe in Buddha, you have to believe in some doctrines, you have to believe in this and that, you know, no. All you have to believe in is causation, actually. That's all you have to believe in, isn't that odd? When you really come down to it, the only thing that realistic worldview means is that you are open to causation. You're open to desire. Is one kind of causation, <laughs> but any also open to other kinds of things. So it's causation. That's the realistic worldview. Is you're open to causation, and you know you're ready to work on to, on getting rid of negative causation. You don't even put it in terms of cultivating positive causation right away. You could because you, you know. The underlying life is suffering, it has this cause of this delusion, there is a ability to be free of it, and so, okay, I can see that causation, and that particular causation of that delusion, I'm going to do something about it. So you're open to causation, you, and that's very deep, because that, and it's theoretical also at the first moment, it's intellectual, it's rational. 
because actually your unconscious self-habit, identity habit, absolute uh, identity habit, absolute self-habit, absolute self-sense, that means, is not open to causation. Because you think there's something unchanging, fixed there. That's you. That's the real you. And actually you project into other things some sort of fixed essence into them. Look at all world philosophies. Plato, I, the idea, that, you know, the self, uh, you know, essence or the self idea that it's, it's an abstract absolute that instantiates itself in any phenomenal person. The tableness that makes the table a table, etc. Look at the metaphysics of, of theories based on that delusion, on the experience of being driven by such a delusion, that everything has an absolute thing or it would all become meaningless and chaotic. You know? The attempt to kind of control conceptually this world in which you feel anxious, depressed, and addicted. So, by, uh, yeah, that delusion is called addiction, actually. If people translate it affliction, the word is klesha, or kilesa in Pali, or klesha in Sanskrit. And klesha means something that twists you. It's a, it twists you and causes you pain. So therefore, people who translate as affliction, which I used to do, is, are wrong. Because affliction is the pain. You know, this is the cause of the affliction. And addiction is actually the way, it, way the weight of that word in our culture is really perfect for klesha. Because the reason that you're gripped by addiction is addiction seems to give you a buzz. It isn't that heroin or cocaine or or whatever, or your egotistical habits are that unpleasant to you, or that anger is unpleasant to you. You know, you're feeling weak and oppressed and bugged by people, and then you feel, and you feel kind of relieved when you grow up, and you sort of blast them away. You feel, and this gives you a feeling of relief. When you, when you have a kind of desire for something, you're imagining some sort of unity or union with that, and um, food or or people or sex or whatever it is or position or status or wealth and so and so it gives you a buzz and, and but then it doesn't satisfy then you need more of it then you need more anger then you need more aggression and then you need more delusion and more confirming your self importance over others that specific delusion of self and so like an addictive substance it, it seems to be helpful and then you crash you know? and it makes you weaker and worse and worse, you follow. Mm -hmm. You get more and more psychotic in the, about the delusion of self, right? So addiction is perfect in the sense that it's, it's the seductive surface of it, but then it harms, harms you. you know? so, so it causes pain, in other words. So, so you, get, you get this theoretical idea, insight, rational insight, that there cannot be an absolute self or anything separate from the process of causation when you develop a realistic worldview that everything I, that's important to me is, is engaged in a process of causation. So that's your realistic worldview, which then, right away, when you have a realistic worldview, it, you're aware that it's sort of pressing against the unrealistic, unconscious view of your own absoluteness. So that you kind of, you're, it puts you in a little bit of a bind, the realistic worldview. But because your, your learning and your critical reflection has made it kind of strong that, well, of course everything is caused. I, if there's something uncaused, I haven't found it. If, when I find something, even that affects me, so it's a part of a causal process, whatever I find. Okay, I can have an idea of something uncaused, sure, but I haven't found one of those. Because, you know, if it's outside the causal process, my process of finding is a causal process, I can't find it. But, of course, I feel there's something really real there. I, you know, you kind of see it to yourself. So then, second branch of the noble of the therapy is realistic intention or motivation, some kalpa. Again, that's, again, theoretical. It's Conceptual. Some couple means even totally conceptual. Because it's not like intention like a mm feeling. Because the mm feeling is, 
I just want to go have some more mangoes. You know, I want to be the king. I want to be president. I want to be a billionaire. You know, I want, I want. That's the gut feeling. That's the gut motivation of the animal instinct. Or eros. Or I want to get rid of such and such. Eros and thanatos, right? Polymorphous perversity and murderous aggression. The, and the, the, which are the result of the fundamental delusion of the self, of the absolute self. So, realistic motivation is conceptual in the sense that I reason that everything is causal. I recognize that I have this space of uncontrolled, uncaused thing that I can't control. And so my motivation is I'm going to gain control over that. I'm going to learn about that. I'm going to become conscious of that unconscious. I'm going to experience it, be aware of it, be attentive to it, find out if it really has to control me, or if there's a place from which I can control it or not. But that's going to be my motivation. That's the primary thing that I can do in relation to the, the way of inter all these interactions with this world that is overwhelming to me. So that is where the mind, you know, everything depends upon the mind, that whole Dhammapada world comes from. It is intention to find out the real root of either suffering or maybe freedom from suffering. Because, you know, although someone gave you such a prognosis, the doctor, you don't know if he's correct his analysis yourself right away. And actually you subliminally don't necessarily think it's that correct. You don't think the way you feel about yourself is a delusion causing your suffering. You don't necessarily think that. But you're sort of taking, well, he's a doctor and I am depressed, anxious, and addicted. So I'm going to maybe, okay, I'll try it out. And you get a motivation, I'm going to try it out. And then the next few things have to do with well, who are you that you're going to try it out? How, what is your engagement in the causal process? Do you, that, that it gives you the ability to try it out. And the first thing you realize is that you are engaged in society as part of your causal process. And maybe you're not engaged with it in the most supportive way for what you've become motivated to try to do, which is to discover your reality. So the next is realistic speech. Why is that important right away? Because speech is where you join a causal mind of the collective, where you, you think in terms given to you by the culture, that is your other people around you, other people in your past, etc., other people in your community. And in, even when you're thinking verbally in your own mind, your inner monologue, I love that that's in the description of this, this event that we're doing here together, is that you know, the, your inner conceptual verbal mind are in using words as only finally Wittgenstein kind of admitted in philosophy, you're using words that are public. Not, they're not somehow, you made them up out of yourself. You learn them and they are part of you. So your own inner voice is speaking with a culturally determined, uh, uh, maybe over-determined vocabulary. And so realistic speech means then Speech that is beneficial, that produces understanding, produces freedom, not speech that produces domination, harm, aggression, and confirms delusion. So realistic, and then that's elaborated in all kinds of ways, but it's basically not creating disturbance between you and the others uh, through speech, which is your primary way of relating to others in a way, is speech. Then realistic action and that it's separated from speech because speech is so important but action includes it sort of emphasizes physical interaction and, and it's your ethical way of being are you living in a way that is harming others uh, are you are you living in a way either by being sensibly greedy about them or hostile do you are you a arms dealer are you a butcher are you a, you know etc you know all kind of ethical you kill do you take from others what they don't really to part with? Do you abuse them sexually in some way? Do you use sexuality even harmfully? Sexuality being very, very important in physical interaction because it is the one in which there is a, can be a merger of self and other, and when the non, therefore the non-absolutes of the self can be experienced by the human being. 
And so using that in a way of creating more distance between yourself and others is very harmful, both to the other, abusive to them, and harmful to yourself. By missing that lesson that your own achieved evolutionary biology can give you in that context. So, and, but, and there are also mental ethics of ha har harboring, you know, harmful thoughts, greedy thoughts, and deluded thoughts. But they don't emphasize the mental one, because they've already been dealing with that with realistic worldview and realistic motivation. So the, the realistic action is the physical one. Then down at the really practical level, they have realistic livelihood. And so there it's like, are you, you know, earning a living in society? It's, it's really ethics coming down to how you're living in which society and how, how you participate in it. So those three are, co are called the higher education in ethics. In the process, adishiksha means higher education. People always say training. And that's okay at some stage, but in a way, training a little bit because of the nature of our authoritarian culture, where you're supposed to be obedient to authority. Training has the idea of kind of following rules and, you know, military training, training a cat, training a dog, go to do your pee pee and poop over there, you know, etc. you know, sit and get your cookie, or whatever. <laughs> training is a little bit robotic, you know, and, and uh, whereas it's more education is better because education has the idea of bringing out what is within you. You know, the good kind of education, not indoctrination, but bringing out your own wisdom, your own intelligence, your own freedom, your own sensitivity and compassion and so forth, right? So, so it, the Sheila Adishiksha is higher education and ethics. And then after that, you have a realistic effort in the sense that... Uh, that's very important, either to be ethical, that you have a kind of, that's the opposite of depression, actually. And I like to translate that as creativity, because it specifically doesn't mean any kind of effort. It's not effort pursuing your addictions. It's not effort robbing people. It's not effort, um, you know, executing them. It's effort in finding out the true reality it's effort in being positive ethically. It's effort in discovering your own nature of the mind. So it's kind of creativity. You can also be a creative robber, you know, killer, you know, whatever. You could be creative that too in a way. But we don't, we think of creativity as something positive, making something better. Better at being better. <laughs> Sarah, that I'm just remembering that. Making it better. That's creative effort, is making it better. Whether or not it really will be, if it seems better to you, even the tiniest little thing, it's important to make it better, you know. And, uh, and that's creative effort, you know. Like, uh, my favorite one in that is, it can be the most minute thing about making something better. Shantideva, in his ethic part, in his wonderful guide to the Bodhisattva way of life, he, he says, in all my future lives, when anybody ever asks me for direction, I will never point to the, to the kitchen this way, or to the men lines over there, or New York City is that way. I'll never point with the, my index finger. Because he doesn't say why, except in a commentary, but that means because you're kind of bossing somebody when you do that. You're kind of emphasizing, well, I know where it is, and you don't. But, and if you're being honest, then you are telling them, so you're being helpful too, but then you're adding this one little kind of bossy thing about it, asserting yourself. He said, if people ask me for directions with my whole hand, like when you invite an honored guest, I will gesture, New York is that way. Like I was inviting an honored guest with my whole hand. And I will think in my own mind, right now I'm inviting you to go to the city. And someday I will invite you to go to Nirvana. <laughs> like an honored guest. So this difference between those two gestures is making it better in giving someone direction. <laughs> a minor thing, but he makes a big thing out of it. I love it. I truly do. And you can see it in some cultures. In, in, in Japan, you know, there's a little bit like uh, hospitality, you know. It should be taught in, in uh, hotel school. <laughs> you should teach that. You know, when the client comes and says, where's the coffee shop? Instead of saying, oh, it's over there. So I'm going to put your head like, oh, that's the guy behind the, the, the concierge. Oh, yeah, I don't want there. I never like that. If they learned in hotel school. 
a Dharma hotel school. Find <laughs> hotel school. <laughs> oh, you're going there. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. So, so that's 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 uh, that's realistic creative effort, and then you have realistic mindfulness. Yay! Number seven. <laughs> if I've been counting right, I haven't forgotten one. Realistic mindfulness, and that mindfulness. The word we are translating mindfulness just is the word for memory. So realistic memory, and here, you know. The way it's taught here, and that's what's part of it, is to try to remember that you're in the present. <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of thinking about what awful things happened yesterday or what great things happened yesterday that are not happening today and feeling, you know, mad or sad, be put more of your focus, sort of rein your consciousness to be aware of the present and what's actually going on in your mind. So the word smriti or sati in Pali, smriti in Sanskrit, means smr. It's like a, it is an introspective, even the sound of it, especially in Sanskrit. Sa is like that, but smr, you know, M R, smr, like a smurf. Smr, smr into your, bring your mind into yourself. And be, be, be aware of your being aware, you know, and go deeper with your awareness. And that's, that's, that's again realistic mindfulness, meaning realistic mindingness, alertness, awareness. It has all kind of components, it's broken up by. And initially, of course, the non-judgmental is very important in the sense that if you're immediately saying, if you're immediately pushed, pushed by your sense of self-identity that I'm a Mr. Goody Goody or Miss Goody Goody, then you're not going to be a one to be aware that, well, I have a killer mind in here, I have a lustful mind in here. You know, you're not going to want to be like Timmy Carter to be interviewed to Playboy about how he sinned in his heart or whatever it was. You know, I've I'm so far with sin in my mind. You know? But <laughs> after Jimmy, you know, you don't want to, any thoughts, thoughts like that you want to suppress, so then you won't go deeper into your unconscious. Fundamental thing about Buddhist psychology, connecting to, to Freud, and, et cetera, up to the, but the recent Bodhisattvas, Winnicott and Epstein, uh, <laughs> is that the unconscious should not have to be officially forever unconscious and drive you helplessly, like Daniel Kahneman tells you, where, and like the neuroscientists are still functioning on, that you can never be in control of yourself, that your conscious mind is tip of an iceberg, and you're going to be driven by the vastness of the unconscious iceberg forever and forget about it. So therefore, find a pill. You know, that's a materialist thing, is, the, is taking that conclusion to the very unfortunate, domineering extreme of our corporate culture. So don't listen to that. Buddhist psychology reinforces those who really want to deal with, want to want to offer the talking cure that you can be more conscious, not just vent something out of it, but you can be conscious of it. You can find out the mechanisms in the unconscious that drive out of where from that the deepest one is the absolute false, the absolutized sense of self, and that's what mindfulness starts to do. And so, in a way, mindfulness has both a component of meditation in it and of wisdom, because it's exploring. Wisdom is the exploring reality part, and meditation is the one, is the concentrated, drilling deeper part. And then the drilling deeper part, so in a way, it's a kind of bridge between the first branch of the, of the noble path, which is realistic worldview, and the last branch, which is realistic samadhi, samadhi, and the of samadhi deep means intelligence again, the thought or intelligence. And a means addressing something, and some means totally. So it's what it's defined as chittasya ekagrita, one pointedness of mind. So it's where you really are not distracted by anything, and it is it's what we think of as the sort of highest type of meditation. But it's bridged in mindfulness between you're knowing something should, or everything should be causal. My impulse to be addicted, my impulse to be depressed, my to think that I'm, I'm the absolute and it's just no good, and like I'm going to shoot myself or something. You know, where it goes when you listen to your, your deluded inter -mon inner monologue that tells you no good, like famous Meister, you know, Meister Eckhart told him, you know, did, you know, if you know his story. And, uh, and it bridges between the first and the, and the last mindfulness. And, and, but it has to be based on that creativity. It has to be based on the ethical 
faces. So mindfulness, although sometimes it's put with meditation in the higher education in mind, it also can be part of the higher education in wisdom. It's a, it's a thousand year, multi-thousand year debate within the Buddhist sciences, within the Buddhist psychology as to which it goes to. Because really it goes to both, mindfulness does. The bare attention has a wisdom component because it's seeking reality. And of course the bare attention has a concentration component because it's trying to, you know, not be distracted by unrealities. Okay. And then finally, realistic one point concentration. And the point is, you don't just, now I'm doing realistic ethics, now I'm doing realistic concentration, now I'm doing realistic worldview. Basically, the Eightfold Path, they're just the limbs of the path. And you want to encompass the whole path if you want to reach, because the whole path as a whole becomes a cause of freedom. Although then, there, once you, when you get close to it, then, when you get close to it, then the causal process opens you beyond cause and non-cause, beyond concept and non-concept, beyond, it doesn't bring you into non-conceptuality. It's, 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 ju it's just as much beyond non-conceptuality as beyond conceptuality. It's like, you can have a theory about this apple is really delicious and it has this and that and those kind of things and that other, and I eat it, that keeps the doctor away and all many things, but actual <laughs> eating an apple where Sort of the boundary between you and apple dissolves, and you it transcends a really delicious one. Maybe transcends your concept even of an apple temporarily. Then that's experience, and you've gotten to your deeper experience where you're not separating yourself by some notion of I'm experiencing, and you're having a non-conceptual experience. We call it non-conceptual, but it's beyond the duality of conceptual and non-conceptual, really speaking. You can't find either yourself or the experience in it. You're lost in it. You're blown away in it. And that's really important. Okay? So that's the four noble truths. And that's the that's psychotherapy that Buddha applied initially to these five really screwed up guys. They literally screwed up. Like that. You know, when you don't cut your fingernail for years, it grows around your finger. You can find, if you go to India, you'll find yogis and at the Kumbh Mela or in Benares, who have fingernails growing like that wow. around their finger. It's very funky. <laughs> really, cleaning your fingernails is a nightmare. And then, of course, they don't bother. Okay, so now we're going to have lunch. And I did run over. I'm sorry. I was trying to do it as quickly as I could.